and he is the uh, uh, current CEO for EPID, which of course has an illustrious history. And you're going to tell us about. It. Go ahead. Yeah. <coughs> the focus is on history. It'll be on history, um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, prehistory, and then and history, and then future history. You know, this is a nicely recursive definition of history, and it also proves the recursive unsolvability of the. The halting problem. So, if anybody wants to take a break and go past the PhD orals right now, <laughs> um, if you're going to uh, predict into the future, the, the futurist Paul Sappho advises us that you should uh, look at least as far into the back as you want to forecast into the future. And I'm going to find the ticket right now to forecast 500 years. So, <laughs> all right. Okay, good. So, um, exactly 1,000 years ago this year is the last time we heard from this guy. Oddly. Here. Oddly. So it's perfect, right? And uh, it, it turns out that this is a, a, and it's very important for us, you know, we, we're all standing at best on the shoulders of our, uh, of the people who came for us, and we hope we're not standing on their feet, right? Can you and, hold the microphone? Sure. So we're And that was me move around a little bit. And uh, th this is an explorer that we all respect and revere, who started off and he was trying to get to the Hebrides, which are, of course, in Scotland. And gets blown off course. And eventually, he ends up uh, in Newfoundland, uh, looking for a harbor. The harbor he wants to get to is the one where Keith Kid is, and it hasn't been created in only for a thousand years. It's in a harbor. It's a thousand miles in. So he spends several more trips uh, for the rest of his career going up and down the coast, uh, trying to find a place to do the first transatlantic radio transmissions and fails. Uh, and of course, as we know, uh, it's another 900 years before Marconi discovers Cape Cod. So uh, let's take a really quick look at how we got here, just so we have some sense of this. Uh, the first uh, wireless telegraph was. Uh, proposed as, a, as an electrostatic um, phenomenon in an obscure place, Scott's Magazine. Of course, it is from Scotland. And uh, it's uh, another hundred years before anything is materially done on, uh, on wireless. Uh, it's of note, James Cook Maxwell, right? Uh, unifies what was thought, actually at the time he was thinking he was unifying light as well as electricity and magnetism, right? That's actually what he wrote. Two uh, critical papers made in 61 and 65. And we know that his major contribution was a set of equations that, what, well, don't <laughs> physics majors intimidate English majors with their t-shirts. <laughs> so, so another decade later, uh, and by the way, that, that's Maxwell's Tartman. Uh, another decade later, another guy from Scotland, that's his part number one, um, Alec Bell invents and files a patent on the acoustic telegraph. There is some debate, debate about exactly who was first. I'm not getting into that. I don't care. Besides, the other guy was what, not Scottish. And <laughs> I want to point out to you that Maxwell solved the fundamental problem that made Einstein say, uh, that he was not standing on the shoulders of Newton, but of Maxwell, right? When Maxwell was 30. And Bell was the ripe old age of 38. Okay. And we're going to take a look at Marconi now. Marconi didn't even go to school. He was from a wealthy Italian family, and so he got tutored at home. And he starts messing around with an idea called wireless telegraphy when he is a teenager. And by 20, because just a few years earlier, um, the, the Hertzian waves had been published. And he studied this as a teenager. At 20, he demonstrates the first wireless telegraph. And at 23, the first open sea communications. And at 28, the first transatlantic messages. Okay, so what I have to say is, millennials, what have you done for us lately? <laughs> And this is important because the maker phenomenon very often is a phenomenon of young people, right? 
the kind of, I'm going to go mess around with things, try things out, and so forth. Very often, it's, you know, I started out when I was 10 building radios. In fact, I started with product design when I was just a little older than that. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's very much a young phenomenon uh, at its roots. People decide this is a thing they want to do, it's a person they want to be, usually when they're very young. Um, in the 1890s, Andrew Crumberry was born. <laughs> that's his partner on the left. Uh, his future wife is too, that's his partner on the right. Uh, that might puzzle you. I, I do look younger than I am, but actually that's my grandfather. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the reason that's important is that I want you to have a sense of, of historical perspective that everything we're talking about here happened, you know, in a human being's lifetime. I, you know, I knew my grandfather and my grandmother, right? died a while ago, but uh, everything we're going to talk about, all these developments, uh, the, the maker phenomena are, you know, compacted into a very short period of time. And then, importantly, 1903, right within months of when Marconi is being highly productive, the Wright brothers have a demonstration, the first demonstration of sustained play of motorized, heavier-than-air craft, and also a different thing, also a hard problem, it's solve a problem of controlling them by separating it into a three-axis problem. They're both important. So, very productive time. Now, keep in mind, 1903, first powered flight. By 1908, there's this guy, in fact, actually 1906, he starts, this guy named Eddie Heath, who starts an airplane company. So, you can tell how many months that is from the first demonstration of flight. And to, this is a little bit like Lee's story, right, about spinning out all of these, these uh, companies in Silicon Valley started from meetings that started in 75. And the first true full kit plane where you buy everything in Stata Motor was 1928, but there were things that show you a couple of pictures here quickly um, in the next slide just to, to make it a graphical visual. But uh, the first just Stata Motor kit was in 1928, it was a heat kit. Uh, in 30, he did, uh, does anybody here fly? Okay. Uh, do you fly gliders? Does anybody fly acrobatically? Okay. All right. So, God, I can't be the only guy in the room. All right. So, Simulator. All right. Fair enough. So, so, he was the first person on the planet to ever do a loop in a glider. He didn't do one loop. He did four loops, and he did it at 1,200 feet and landed within a few feet of where he started. And to do that, you have to understand, that's only 120 stories when you start. Normally, at 1,200 feet, you're already approaching the pattern. At 800 feet, if you're already in the pattern, you're not, you're not in good condition. Okay. <laughs> um, so he did four loops and landed within a few feet. He was, he was a stunt pilot. He was a test pilot. He was a designer of, of these products, including the kits. And the next year... He crashed and died. <laughs> um, he died in a plane that he had designed. He was a test pilot. And so the company uh, was kept as a, an aircraft company, and including a kit company, but it was moved. It was bought by a guy who uh, got it from the, the wife of he, and he moved it. And within a year, it was to change that again. And all that thing, and power down. And I'm just going to shoot a couple of pictures. I want to give you an idea of what you're seeing here. Heathkit has historical, this is a history of me, right? Heathkit has historical uh, materials that are uh, over a foot thick of things like this. Original, dating back to 110, 120 years ago. So that's the original stuff, the best they can do reproduce it. That is the first airplane, the 1907 picture. On the right, that's Amelia Earhart inspecting one of the Heath airplanes. The one in the middle is a picture of what's marked in our historical record as the first actual kit with all the parts. The bottom is one of the many kits. And we have more than this I could possibly show you today. Okay. But this gives you some idea of what it has. It was a real chore to try to, to prune it down to a few examples. So, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in time to electronics, because many people here probably are interested in electronics. Uh, I'm kind of skipping over the war. And what happened at the end of the war is, uh, let's see, who knows who Knut Rockney? Coach of Notre Dame, okay. So he had this problem in 1930 that he wanted to be able to communicate with people on the field. I think he was sick at the time. And so a couple of guys named Burroughs and Kahn 
and got together and built the world's first public address system so we could use it for the remaining. And they formed a company, eventually called um, Electro Voice. And Al Khan of Electro Voice is the guy who told Howard Anthony, hey, listen, you know, I know you're doing all that airplane stuff, but you really should look at what's happening with World War II surplus now that the war is over. You can get this stuff for a song. You can make things out of it. You ought to make this for your kids. Use this for your kids. You can be so even have. There's one story, hard, hard to establish, but one story that he actually sent a trainload of these electronics parts to Howard Anthony. But it is, but, but I, I do know that he got trainloads of material, and he would sell some parts, and then they decided, you know, we're going to try doing a kit, an electronic kit. And so in Radio News, and also in um, Radio Craft, in 1947, they put an ad in for an oscilloscope for $39.95. They came, well, we'll see if this sells. And it sold like hotcakes, and they couldn't keep up with the brand. So they immediately added a voltmeter and a generator. And uh, the thing I want to point out about doing test equipment first, this is subtle, it's metal, right? Because if you give people a kit for test equipment, not only are they doing a maker act, but now they have tools to do more maker acts, right? So it has this, this multiplicative pump priming the economy effect when you start out the test equipment. And pretty quickly in the 1950s, uh, new verticals were added. Uh, AM and FM tuners, amplifiers, shortwave, marine amateur radio products, I'll start with the next day. So needless to say, how <laughs> Anthony died in a plane crash. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I'll explain these guys in a second. But he was testing a plane that he was going to buy. And he and three people died in a plane crash. This is a good time for me to pause and say that I have a great team. Anne is a COO, Jason is a VP engineering, and DJ Peterson, who is my chief engineer and general manager of Heathkit, and uh, worked there both as a high school student in the 60s and also after he got his engineering degree in the 70s. DJ, stand up so people know who you are. If you have questions about real history, you can ask. So, DJ tells me, I'm not allowed to fly. Can you guess what? <laughs> By the way, did I tell you I'm an acrobatic survey pilot? <laughs> so, an interesting thing happened during this era that's really relevant to the maker movement, which is that there was this very tight cluster cohort of people who were born within about 48 months. There's this guy way on the left who was born with wireframe glasses and a black turtleneck. <laughs> and a guy next to him who was born, you know, skinny guy in a skinny tie with wireframe glasses, and for some reason he has a bill in his hand. And probably, I can think of three reasons he would have a bill in his hand. <laughs> and there's this super Dale guy, and then there's some guy with glasses and a mustache. I'm not quite sure who he would be in a you know, he could talk. And, 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 and by the way, the, you see, I put camp in there. I, I love the fact that uh, I love the fact that camp is a motorized robot. That is <laughs> so, so right at the time that the economy is shifting in a way that makers now have a corporation that is producing thousands or hundreds of thousands of these things a year and vastly building. <laughs> and as the technology is shifting towards electronics, we're entering the space age, atomic age, and so forth, and head towards the computer age. We have this tight cohort of people who are all born within about 48 months of each other. It's a very interesting historical phenomenon. So during the 60s and 70s, I'm going to come back to now, the company grows to on the order of $100 million. We have 350 kits in the catalog, several catalogs a year, another 350 buy sell items and accessories in addition to the kit. There are new major verticals that are developed, AM, FM, TVs, people building their own television sets for home. I don't know if you were alive in the 60s, some of you were. You might know that TVs were expensive and they were rare and color was a new thing that RCA rolled out. Lots of people saved a lot of money and had a lot of fun and a lot of satisfaction by building their own television set in many models. Amateur radio, shortwave, had a new robotics vertical, education, home appliance vertical, um, even motorbikes, um, the, the uh, famous Heath kit uh, boogie bike and trail bike. 
Uh, and for adults, you know, you had money and you could go out and buy these kits. But for young people who were not yet adults, who didn't have a sort of income, it was in a way much more important for guys like, you know, Mr. Turtleback or me. Because for us, it was aspirational. And we get the catalog, and it was 100 pages long, and you couldn't possibly buy three of those things with the money you made selling newspapers or whatever you did, much less buy all the ones you really wanted, right? But the only thing more powerful to create an engineering culture than building things is wanting to build things. Yes. So it's essential. It had an essential role that it was an aspirational thing that people were getting these catalogs. Well, opportunity. It was 100 pages of opportunity, of excitement, and ideas. Do we know how many of those catalogs were produced? DJ, you know? Uh, what was how, many, how many catalogs were produced? Oh, they did about like, four a year. But there was a spring, uh, well, summer, winter, <coughs> and... But, but how, how many were actually printed of each one of those? Oh, oh what was the difference? Oh, the quantity? I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. We actually have a, courtesy of DJ, we have a leather-bound set for several decades of these. Wow. Mm -hmm. it's, I, can, feel, I can tell a story. Yeah, just the whole story of DJ. Yeah. Yeah. But we don't, not all of them were leather-bound, but several decades um, in our archives. Um, and computers came along, of course, and when that happened, Heathkit entered the market, and that really ratcheted up the revenue and the product, uh, which turned out not to be a great thing. I'm going to talk about that in a second. It led to the demise in a funny way. But uh, first I want to tell you what happens when you sell one million instances of maker products as opposed to 20 little kits. Here's some lessons you learned. The first thing that's very surprising to me, I don't know, um, you know, because I think of like my own mom in the 60s, um, more than half the customers today who write to us, and I mean every email, who write to us mm. and tell us they built a Heath Kit television set are written. I found this fascinating. That's fascinating. Okay? Um, I can think of reasons why it might be true, but I don't know why it's true. Um, the second thing is that there are, there are three different categories with respect to ego of, of activities you can engage in. Some of them are like mathematics, where most people think they're really bad at it, no matter how good they are. And some of them it's like, uh, say, sociology. If I ask you, are you good at sociology? You kind of scratch your head. You won't really have an ego opinion about it. And then there are things like driving, where it turns out that when you poll people, statistically, a very large majority of people think they are better than average drivers. Okay. So unless you live in Lake Wobegon, that's not possible. <laughs> so soldering turns out to be very much like driving. It's in the driving head. Everyone thinks they're good at it. But, uh, you know, again, DJ worked in the service department. He can tell you the gory details. But in net, over 90% of the time when it was a problem with anyone's kids that they didn't know how to solder. So, uh, a third, a third thing that, and this is this is not opinion. This is a formal study that Heathkit did a half a century ago right, of, of our customers. Um, how easy and hard are they to build? And it turns out that we have eight-year-olds who have built our current digital clock all on their own, and they're completely successful and very proud. And their parents couldn't be proud. Um, and people who have never done anything like this before, who are extremely successful, what that. And the one category of people who consistently screwed up are electrical engineers. <laughs> and, and we get these letters from them. And these letters are like, I need a new part X, Y, Z. And, and what's wrong with your kid? And, and we say, well, let us help you. You know, tech support's here to help you. What's the problem? I need a new part. Well, how can you need a new part? Well, I, it's no good anymore. <laughs> and, and what you discover is that they did something like taking the the front panel overlay, and decide that they're smarter than us, so they put it in an acid bath to make it be the one that they wanted, or they carve it up, or they, and so they destroy these things, and then they tell us that our specifications were wrong, and that we're stupid. And by the way, my favorite of all of these letters, and this is, this is not a one-off, this happens like every six months, is you get the person who writes it and says, you know, you guys are screwed it up so bad, you're so stupid, and I'm an engineer, I know better than you. By the way, you should hire me. <laughs> so, there are three steps to succeeding, and one of them is follow the directions, and you can guess the other two. <laughs> Guarantees it. All right. So, even though evil forces were occurring in the economy and also within the company, um, there was a big payoff from all those baby boomers. 
how did Steve Jobs, oh, excuse me, uh, you know, black tournament guy, how did he get to the point where he could be there in that room in the mid-70s or create a billion dollar company over a period of decades? And this is what Steve Jobs himself said. He said that he built heat kits, that someone down the street helped him, and there's another story that a person uh, who was a mentor of his, who was a mentor of his, gave him one when he was young. Um, and he said, you build a thing yourself, it gave one an understanding of what was inside the finished product and how it worked, but maybe even more importantly, it gave one a sense that one could build the thing that one saw about oneself in the universe. You looked at a television set and you would think, I haven't built one of those, but I could. So, what does it mean to support people who want to be makers? It, it empowers them to believe that they can do things they didn't know they could do. That's one of the reasons I find that, that, um, that you know, women who build TVs so exciting, uh, right? Okay, so what happened? Everyone knows there's a long period when we didn't make kids. There were a few different factors, and uh, it's a little like two blind men in the elephant, where everyone's got this one opinion about the thing, and there were several factors. One of them was, I, I started going, even when I was in high school, I started going to night college, taking electronics courses. And the thing I saw before this period was that uh, there was this miniaturization, that there was sort of the Japanification of the electronics, uh, that things were shifting very rapidly, not just from back to back into to solid state, but also to micro-miniaturization, to very high density uh, printed circuit boards compared to what had been done in previous decades, uh, to use an integrated circuit instead of transistors, and suddenly um, the, the repair regime, for example, for electronics shifted from change of vacuum tube, and your main job as a tech is to figure out which one, to pull a whole printed circuit board card out, throw it away, it's not worth fixing, and put a new one in. And that change was very rapid, and corresponding to that, you have all these engineers who are at Heath, who 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago joined the company, they have skills that in general were 10, 20, 30, 40 years old, and the technology is changing very rapidly. And so there were a couple of very large, very ambitious, state-of-the-art projects, one or two in particular, that, that uh, the company really fell on its sword on trying to, uh, trying to get out the door. This is after DJ <laughs> um, um, and, uh, and And then the, 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 the real curse is this thing that Lee is responsible for, which is the growth of the computer industry, right? the microcomputer industry, because what happens when Heathkit was successful and money was pouring in, they have changed hands many, many times, had many owners over the decades, uh, but Zenith came in. And uh, Zenith had in many ways been a competitor, making inferior TVs to the most huge kids like that. Uh, again, DJ can tell you about that. And when uh, Zenith came in, they only wanted, and you might think that this is going to end up with a sense like the cash cow business, and usually that's how m and I can tell you from my experience in the field. Uh, that's not what they wanted. They wanted the computers because they thought there was going to be a lot of revenue and growth in there. They uh, flew that airplane into the ground all on their own, but in the meantime, what they did was they starved the kid business. So, senior engineer leaves them with the They don't give them any resources. And so they choked off the business that actually was the cash cow because you've got 300 kids, you just keep selling them. You don't even have to design new ones. You can make money for a long time. They just let it start. And um, eventually the whole company devolved and parts of it were spun out. A uh, little bit of it, the doorbell and, and lighting business was spun out into a new company called Heat Zenith. Um, and it was bought three times in a row and now the Kentucky can make the only. So don't write us about your broken doorbell, it's not our product. <laughs> um, but what remained was an education focused company, it was a one trick pony. That means it's completely dependent on whether or not there's money there for vocational tech and education, and that money dried up, and so the company ended up in bad streets. So that's a very short explanation of how the company got to where it was uh, six or eight years ago. Um, some company, some company employees back then did try proposing some kits. They, they couldn't get it off the ground. Again, DJ could probably tell you more about that than I can, but the net result was that management just felt completely reinforced. Oh, well, this is not going to work out. We can't do kits. And so, uh, thing that might have saved them, they, they abandoned. And they were only down to half of the people. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> half a dozen years ago, um, the current management team gave it 
a new start. I say it's a new management team. I technically say that you know DJ and I are we're new old stock, right? Okay. We've been around the block. Um, but in terms of DJ, you know, as someone who's there a couple times before, um, if it weren't for DJ, it would be impossible to do this company because he's the corporate memory of all the systems and procedures. When I'm thinking it takes a year to get this kid out, he'll say, "Yeah, it takes a year to get a kid out." <laughs> so, um, yeah, he can. Uh, there, there are little toy things you can do in the weekend. I'll print a circuit board and have a one sheet, you know, uh, uh, you know, flyer to help people to try to put it together. That is not a heat kit, right? And it takes us to have your ear to make any profit. Um, we've built everything all over again because they had eliminated manufacturing, warehouse, back office, logistics, operations, publications, R&D, production, productization of products, uh, kit fulfillment, service, tech support, all has to be there. And it all has to be there before you can sell the first kit. So we have, and we also have to build up a, an economy for 20 years or so of young people have not known how to turn a screwdriver. Uh, but, but we're there now, we've, we've released a number of products and we've sold thousands of kids now, about a thousand customers, so you know, we're under win. Um, so let me tell you about the future, this is my final slide, I just want to comment on what concerns me. Escape. I did. Okay. I have escaped. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the first thing is that you know there's this great impact in the last decade of Arduinos. And uh, th there, are, there are people like these three guys who are absolutely central <coughs> to uh, what makes MakerDump effective. And that has to do with people skills and publications and venues and a variety of things like that that are sort of um, soft skill related, right? But there's also physical product. And the physical product that probably has the most impact on makers. I would say even more than 3D printing, I think this is the Arduino, no less thing. I also think it's the very worst thing for makers. Um, we might get to this in quest, I don't know. Um, and also for professional engineering, I, I think we, we have a certain probabilistic risk that electronic engineering of certain kinds going to drive right off a cliff uh, because there's a path into getting that interest and then right out of it into the software world and never coming back. And one of our missions is to try to keep people doing things in hardware as well as software. Um, and then also, I think there's a there's an interesting question about the the companies that replaced Radio Shack, I'm not going to name them here because they're being videotaped, but you might know who they are. You know, when I was young, I used to go down the street to Radio Shack, I could buy a couple of transistors or my buddies who wouldn't, we could wire up something on a breadboard. And today, there are other companies who sell electronic parts and they treat themselves as educational and fun, and, and you know, maybe they use social media or they have pink hair or something. Um, you won't be seeing me with pink hair, right? Uh, but they, uh, they, Fulfill actually the role, not a heat kit, but of Radio Shack of 40 years ago. But uh, that is, they sell little parts, and you know, the average uh, bill of sale is under $50 for this company, typically. So um, there are little parts businesses. But there is a question of as they move into seeing educational and so forth, are they kind of eating some of, I don't want to say skimming the cream, but maybe eating some of the, the opportunity that would be there for some of the other companies? Uh, that could be maker companies. Uh, do they do they take enough of that? I'm actually be bridged from what the other guys have to say about their experiences in this field now. We're slightly protected because we make really hard to make products. Not hard to build, but hard to make, right? Hard to manufacture, hard to design products. We have a 50 or 100 page manual and it takes a year to do, and none of those guys have patience to spend a year and make a thousand component product that is going to last you for half a century. Right now on eBay, every single day, 200 new people. Uh, listings are posted for half century old products. They last a long time. And of course, if you can repair it, like say an airplane, you know, <clears> then <throat> you can keep going almost forever. So uh, that's a very different world from this one. But, but for people who are in this space, I think it's, 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 it's a race to the bottom. I worry about bad impact on the, uh, the industry. Okay, that's, that's the end of my talk.